sort of a famous classified ad that's been uh, read by Jay Leno and made its way around the uh, internet for years and years and years. It had first appeared in the September-October ad, uh, the ads of the 1997 edition of Backwoods Home Magazine. This ad appeared among the help wanted. It read, wanted, someone to go back in time with me. This is not a joke. P.O. Box 322, Oakview, California. You'll get paid after we get back. Must bring your own weapons, safety not guaranteed. I've only done this once before. And the man who wrote the ad who received thousands upon thousands of responses to his P.O. Box. And in the 17 years since he has placed that ad, he has heard from every state, he has heard from every continent, including Antarctica. And some of the people who, who applied had, have had incredible qualifications, including combat experience and martial arts training. And one guy even had explosive expertise. Some folks just wanted to go back in time so they could correct some terrible wrong or save, save a loved one. Many said they would go with them for free. Now, as you probably know, at least I hope you do, this is a false job description. It was actually written as filler for a magazine that just got started, and they hadn't sold all their classified advertising space. Now, the script for us this morning is basically Jesus' job description for people to do his work in the world. What does it look like to go with Jesus? What are faithful Christians supposed to do? And sometimes I wonder if in the church, if we've been living under a false job description of what it means to follow Jesus. Now, for the past century or so, the church has had this paradigm that we've lived under, including up, up until now, that, that we should come to Jesus, we should go to church, because it will improve our quality of life. We should come to church, it, is, it has been said, it has been preached, for the same reason that we should join a health club or the Kiwanis or the Parent Teacher Association or buy organic groceries. It'll be better for our family and for our children. Coming to church will enhance our daily existence. It'll make our daily life better. We'll see sunshine and lollipops and rainbows 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Well, this bears almost no resemblance at all to Jesus' life or to the life of his disciples that we see in Scripture. And it is not the job description that Jesus gave to the 12 disciples that he called, the 12 apostles. In fact, if you read Matthew 10, a job description based upon Matthew 10, uh, Matthew 10 might read like this. Want it, you, not just anyone, to go proclaim the kingdom of God in Jesus' world must be able to proclaim the kingdom through word and otherworldly deeds, no experience or materials necessary. Employer will supply all you need, rejection by the world likely. Now let's look at this job description. First of all, Jesus wants you. He wants you. He is calling you by name. Now, Matthew teaches us that he called uh, 12 apostles, and then he lists out their names, complete with Judas Iscariot, who Matthew reminds us betrayed Jesus. And I know one of the criticisms of, of Scripture, one of the stumbling blocks who try to read God's Word from cover to cover is all the long lists of names. Shem beget Arpashad, and Arpashad beget Shelah, and Shelah beget Eber, etc., etc., etc. The Bible, by one count, recounts 3,237 names. And so when we get to a list of names, the great temptation is merely just to skip over it and get to the really important and more relevant parts of God's Word. And here in Matthew is this brief little list of 12, and we struggle to read through it without skipping to the really important stuff. And the majority of these uh, disciples, after all, end up being minor characters in the biblical story. Thaddeus, who ever heard of Thaddeus? What did he do? Well, why does the Bible go to the trouble of mentioning 3,237 people, most of which never factor in again in the story? It is because Jesus calls us by name. God knows you by name. Your name is important. And it's not because you are the lead actor in the biblical story. And where we are tempted to see as unimportant individuals, especially individuals we don't know, individuals by whom we are separated 3,000 years and 5,000 miles whose name we cannot begin to pronounce, Jesus knows they are important. 
God knows you by name, and he is precious to you, and he is calling you by name. Indeed, the word teaches that our names are written in another book, the book of life. Second, Jesus wants to send you out. He wants to send you out. No sooner had he called the 12, and we get the names of the 12 all listed, and the next line is, these 12 Jesus sent out. The book of life is not a, like a reservation list that we would get on at a five-star restaurant, allowing us to breeze in unencumbered at the appointed time and enjoy a magical evening. Jesus writes our name in the book of life, calling us to him so he can send us out again. And this is a pattern with Jesus. Jesus never calls anyone without sending them out, back out into the world. Matthew 10, 5 and 6, these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now what's so interesting here is Jesus gave these 12 really specific instructions. He started off by saying, don't go there. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't even think about entering any town in Samaria. Instead, you go to your own people. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And now we know, of course, this is not where Jesus landed. Thank God, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin for every human being is good news for every single human being who has ever lived, or it is good news for no one. So, was, so what's going on here? Was Jesus just making it up as he went along? Was he trying to decide what he was going to do? Was he off his game that day? No. Jesus has a plan. He has a plan. And it was not yet time for the Gentiles and the Samaritans. And just as you and I are, are called by name and, and God has placed a call on our life and that is made known to us at a specific time, at a specific place, under a specific circumstance, God is at work at specific places in this world. Most of us, most of us can name a time, we can name a place, we can name a circumstance when God spoke to us through the power of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way, leaving us changed. One of the times this has happened to me in the last year was on September 25th at about 9.45 a.m. I was playing in a friend's charity golf scramble in Lee Summit and he used a man telling a story about his life that has left me changed forever. He spoke to me again at about 11.30 in an email from my wife. You see, Jesus is doing something specific, and he's doing something real, and he's doing something tangible among this group or in that place. His Holy Spirit is moving in this city or that neighborhood or that school or that soccer team. God has a plan that he is working, and he is working it out in real time. It is a plan that impacts specific people, Exact geographic locations, real structures, real situations. Jesus is bringing heaven to earth. And not just in theory. Not as some fond wish or delightful fantasy that is chicken soup for the soul that gives us this vacuous fleeting hope and nothing more. Jesus is really doing it. And because he is doing it, we must really be looking for him. So let me ask you, what is Jesus doing? in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school. He wants to send you out to join him. Now we may say, well, 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 I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what his plan is. How many times have we heard this? I'm just seeking Jesus' plan. Well, we rarely see Jesus' plan at work in our life unless we heed his command to go out. And if we are wondering what Jesus is doing in our life, if we can't see his plan unfolding around us, we may want to consider getting out of our comfort zone and following Jesus out into the world. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, Eric, you just said Jesus spoke to you on a golf course. If you'd ever seen me play golf, you would understand. I was out of my comfort zone, and anyone playing with me is out of their comfort zone as well when I'm on the golf course. But really, there were things going on in my life at that time. Some of you may remember. And Jesus spoke to me in a powerful, powerful way. Third, Jesus' job description is for us to proclaim his kingdom through the word and through otherworldly deeds. So Jesus gave the, the apostles a simple message to carry 
to the lost sheep of Israel, he gave them his message. It was the message that John the Baptist spoke, um, proclaiming about his coming. You go, saying, Matthew 10, 7, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this is an amazing message. It's an amazing message. This is actually the most important statement, the most important development in the history of the world. It is so stunning that it is hard to believe. It is even more difficult to prove. Some of you may have seen the news a couple weeks ago that a little boy from Ohio who was crippled in a terrible car accident admitted that he had lied. And his name was Alex. And Alex told a story that during the moments following his accident after church one Sunday, he had a near-death experience and he was carried up to heaven. And his account became a, became a best-selling book called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. I read the book. I shared it with some of you. A lot of you read the book. Well, little Alex told a vivid story of what heaven looks like, people he had encountered, even God's plan for our lives. They sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Turns out it was a total fabrication. And some people, maybe even a lot of people, especially those who don't go to church, especially skeptics, especially cynics, said, well, that just goes to prove what any rational person would believe. Of course he made it up, because heaven is a myth. See, even in Jesus' day, heaven's existence was doubted. The Sadducees, who were the dominant Jewish sect, doubted that there was any such place as heaven. Um, heaven, the kingdom of God, and everything it entails is a fantastic thing to believe. When Jesus himself was resurrected from the dead, standing there in the flesh in front of the disciples with nail-scarred hands, the word teaches us that many of them doubted, and more than just Thomas. That's why we can't just proclaim, we just can't say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of God is near. We have to show it to a skeptical world. We have to demonstrate it to them. A world that is so beaten and, and, and so bruised by the consequences of sin and broken dreams that they dare not raise their eyes above the dirt of the horizon. And so Jesus commanded the 12 to proclaim the kingdom of heaven by doing the extraordinary. Matthew 10, 8. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Cast out demons, Jesus said. Now, if I said to you in the benediction of in a few minutes, go from here today, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, that would put many of us beyond our comfort zone, to say the least. And I doubt that a lot of us have too much experience raising the dead here this morning. I trouble keeping a lot of you awake during the sermon. It's hard to do. But I don't want to say those kind of things are impossible. They're not. I've seen the sick healed through prayer. I pray against evil and demonic spirits. But those things are not normative for us. If Jesus were standing here today in the flesh, commissioning us, sending us out into the world to join him in making it new, he might command us to demonstrate that the kingdom of heaven is here through slightly less miraculous means. By loving your neighbor beyond reasonable human limits. Being generous with your time and resources beyond what anyone could earthly expect. Acting against your own self-interest with impunity for worldly concerns. Displaying supernatural grace and truth during hellish trials. That's what he might tell us to do to show that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Fourth. With Jesus, no experience is necessary. Jesus will supply what we need. Matthew 10, verses 8 through 10. It says, You receive without pain, now give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or a sandal or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. It's a great scene in one of my favorite movies, The Jerk, starring Steve Martin. The Jerk is this rags to riches story about a corn pone dunce who stumbles his way into a vast fortune only to see it ripped away through a class action lawsuit. And one day he just crumbles as his life is, is falling apart and he decides he's had enough. 
As his mansion is being repossessed by the bank, he claims with impunity, I don't need anyone. I don't need anything. But as he stumbles out the door wearing only a bathrobe, he notices an ashtray. And he says, oh, I need this ashtray. And then he notices a paddle game. He says, oh, I need this paddle game. Then he notices a remote control for a TV and says, well, I need that. And then a lamp he needs and a chair he needs and some matches he needs. And before long, he is stumbling down the street and he is overburdened and encumbered with, uh, with an assortment of items that, that, that for some reason he has discovered that he needs. And his wife, as he leaves, says, I liked it better when it was just you and me. And we didn't have all this stuff. In the church, we have decided there is almost no limit as to what we need to do ministry. Hardly a day passes that I don't receive in, in my mailbox or my email an advertisement for some product or some program that I desperately have to have to reach the world for Jesus. If I only have that, they say. And this is a larger reflection of where the church tends to be, especially for the last hundred years up to and including now. Well, no gold, no silver, one measly tunic. Well, you can't serve Jesus without those things, so we claim. We need, so we believe, massive ministry programs and, and, and church campuses in the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. We need graduate degrees and we need professional trained and unionized pastors with their huge libraries of books to do ministry. We need TV stations and magazines and Kindles, Pat to the Gills and, and, and jazzy websites and strategic plans that would tax General Motors. And a never any list of skills and abilities and, and training to effectively proclaim a simple message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, none of those are necessarily bad things. Let's not start firing unionized pastors, please. The danger here is that we think they are necessary to be effective. We think, well, I have to have the right training. I have to have the right tools. I have to have the, 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 the right words before I can even really begin to serve Jesus. And we need them so badly, we think that some of us wait a lifetime to go out that door. In the meantime, Jesus is saying, the fields are white for the harvest. Everything is ready. And I sometimes wonder if Jesus just likes it better when it's just him and me and you without all the stuff that usually accompanies Christian ministry. And I wonder if he likes it better because when we travel light, we discover that we really only need Jesus, that he's only necessary to proclaim the kingdom because he will supply whatever we need. He will give us power. He will give us authority to do the impossible. And fifth and, and finally, in the Matthew 10 job description, rejection by the world is likely. Jesus told the disciples, you're going to be rejected. You're going to be rejected. He also told them, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Matthew 10, verses 11 through 14. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet for when you leave that house or that town. Now, among my many jobs in life, I had a brief career as a door-to-door -door salesman when I was a kid. I sold uh, greeting cards for several summers to earn prizes and if I sold approximately $5 million worth of greeting cards, I could have earned a $97 dirt bike. I didn't quite get there. I didn't quite get there. In, in, in the training, the 15-year-old who was our leader emphasized that it didn't matter how many doors we knocked on and were rejected. He said, that don't, don't, don't care about that. You'll never make a sale, he said, if, you're, if, you're, if you allow getting rejected to stop you. He was wise beyond his years. When we proclaim the kingdom of God is near in word and deed, that's going to change some people's lives. We're going, to be, we're, we're going to make an impact. But we will experience rejection from others. 
One of the true tests that we share a truth that is worthy of acceptance and embrace is that sometimes, maybe even most of the time, it is rejected. Human beings who are caught up in the clutches of sin have a nearly allergic reaction to the truth. But when we proclaim Christ's kingdom in word and deed, we're going to know what it's like to have doors slammed in our face. We'll know what it's like for people to impugn our character and, and to mock us and to laugh at us and to call us crazy or worse. They might even defriend us from Facebook. Jesus says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Notice what he doesn't say here. He doesn't say it's not painful. He doesn't say it's easy. He doesn't say, well, you need a better approach next time. He does say, have a short memory. Have a short memory. He does say, don't allow the pain of one person's rejection to stop you from sharing the good news of the kingdom of God drawing near with somebody else. Don't make that person pay for your pain. And we may say, well, what does Jesus know about it? He was never rejected. He never had a door slammed in his face. Oh, yeah? When it comes to rejection, Jesus is an expert. No one has been rejected more than Jesus. The world he made, the world he came to save and he, and, and he died for, rejected him. You and I at times reject Jesus. Rejection by the world called him by him and sent into, I'm afraid, is not only likely, but it's a necessity. Let me illustrate this as we, as, as we close. For the last 84 years, standing over the city of Rio de Janeiro is one of the so-called new seven wonders of the world. Some of the most famous images of Jesus ever constructed. It's called Christ, Christ the Redeemer. It stands on one of the highest points around Rio, right on top of a mountain. It is 125 foot tall. It weighs 700 tons. And the statue of Jesus, it gives hope to millions and millions for dozens of miles around and really around the world. He has a 92 foot wide arm span. And his arms bid the world to come to him. It's one of the most iconic images of Jesus in the entire world. But on the top of the mountain, out in the world, Jesus takes a beating. The statue is repeatedly struck by lightning. And the elements cause it to have constant maintenance, constant upkeep. Strong winds, erosions, tropical rain, tropical uh, fungi, all eat away at the statue. It's almost as if the world is rejecting the image of its Savior and Lord placed on top of one of her peaks. Nevertheless, there stands Jesus over Rio, continually defying his broken world, his very presence proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus wants you to stand with him in the world, the broken world he so desperately loves, the world we are called to go into to proclaim him. It won't always be easy. You will endure rejection. There's going to be strong winds and, 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 and lightning strikes and things that just eat away at you constantly. But Jesus will be with you. And he will provide what you need. That's our job description. And there's nothing false about it. Amen.